Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and cultures. I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. So I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Alice McGlashan. Alice is a natural resource management practitioner and environmental educator who lives on a rural bush property in Womboy. She has a master's degree in environmental science and law and a graduate diploma in psychology. Alice spends her free time improving the native hab habitat on the property for wildlife and actively controls feral predators to protect her poultry and lo local native animals. Alice has also developed a Facebook page called Nest Box, Tail, Nest Box Tales to support people wanting to create habitat for hollow, sorry, hollow nesting animals at their place. And there's also an accompanying website for that. Well, hi, Alice. I'm going to stop my share there and say welcome. How are you? Good, thank you. Lovely Excellent. way. Early, early start to a Saturday morning. Yeah. Yeah, oh, we've got to keep you going. We've got to get you up early and get you moving. <laughs> so, uh, Alice, I'll, I'll invite you to jump in. Please just, um, if I've missed anything about you, jump in and correct me. But otherwise, um, I'm going to put myself on mute and I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. Not a problem. Thanks, Alex. Um, welcome, everyone. So just a bit of an intro to today. It's going to be all about trapping options for managing feral predators on your property. Um, so I've got some videos that I'll talk through because it's it's kind of a, a, in, intended to teach you how to do the trapping side of things. So I've pre-recorded video and I'll, I'll talk over um, what's happening. Um, and then also what's legal in your area. So you might be dialing in from a different state or territory. There's great resources to know what traps you're allowed to and permitted to use in your state or territory. Um, and yeah, so I'll, I'll start, I'll just start by playing an intro video of, uh, okay, because the, the number one thing when you're thinking about doing a, a, some trapping or you want to control feral predators on your property is to figure out how many, where they are traveling, um, that type of thing. So monitoring is, that, monitoring is actually pretty important because you might think you have one fox that's patrolling your chicken pen every night but you might in fact have a family of perhaps five foxes. So if you trap one and think, yes, all done, they're all gone, um, then there might be <laughs> another four foxes hanging around and then it might also be other foxes. If you've got a larger rural property, um, there might also be other feral predators around your property that you're not aware of. So monitoring is actually a, a really important thing to do. Uh, we ran a webinar on um, monitoring for feral predator management as part of this series. Um, about a month ago. So the webinar has been recorded and it's up for viewing. I'll just whet your appetite um, now with um, an intro video um, of, of, well, feral predator monitoring that I did on my property a few years ago when um, I was figuring out who went where in terms of foxes. I'd caught one and then I wanted to know if I needed to set the traps again to catch another one. And uh, yeah, I discovered that there was a uh, quite a bit of activity around. So I'll just share my screen. That one. Take it big and go play. So this is um, fast forward speed. So it says fast speed. So this is recording over about 10 nights of um, activity around the back of my bush property. And there's a, a dead fox that I'd already trapped in the um, corner there that the foxes are having a bit of sniff around. But as you can see, I took out one fox, but um, unfortunately that wasn't the only fox on my property. There were eight foxes on my four acre property passing through every night. And I didn't really know how many there were until I got to the end and there were none left with the trapping. So you can see the, the timestamp down below that um, it's the 5th of the 1st, 2017. And you can see the time too, that if you're thinking about other methods, say shooting, um, that foxes have a route that they tend to travel each night and it's pretty regular. They'll, they'll pass by the same, on the same track and often at the same kind of time, depending on 
um, what they found along the way for dinner. Um, so you might go out hunting foxes at 10 o'clock, but you might miss the foxes that would pass through your property at 3 or 4 a.m. in the morning. So there's a, a free roaming cat as well. So if you don't have um, the ability, or I guess the other aspect is we've got four um, wildlife cameras um, available for loan if people are interested in doing some monitoring. Um, better quality to this one, this is a 2017 vintage camera. So if you're interested in doing feral predator control and you'd like to also do some monitoring, you can, if you're a member, you can borrow a camera from us to do exactly this. Almost at the end. So there we go. Just to set the scene of uh, the feral predator um, activity side of things. So um, there's a few different options. Well, I guess why trap in the first instance? My rural property has got neighbours quite close. So I'm four acres and I'm long and skinny. So I've got a neighbour at the front and a neighbour at right at the back, but I've also got houses behind as well. So someone, I couldn't, I'm not permitted to have a shooter come onto my property and hunt because um, stray bullets might go through someone's living room. Um, and I'm also not permitted to um, use baits as well because there's a lot of people's pets around. The neighbor's dog sometimes wanders onto my property. Well, all neighbor's dogs sometimes wander on. Um, I know people get grumpy. It's very rare that they do, um, but that's not great. And I wouldn't be able to, uh, I, I'm not permitted to bait. So I can't shoot, I can't bait, but I want to control feral predators. What do I do? Trapping's pretty much my only option. Um, there might be other people in this same situation. If you're urban as well, you're not going to be able to shoot and you can't bait. Um, so it's, it's kind of, of your options, what can you do? So trapping, there's a few options for trapping, um, cage traps and then um, soft jaw, not the steel jaw ones that you see in dreadful movies. Um, so cage traps and foot traps. So cage traps, you can um, maybe catch young naive foxes, but it's pretty tricky to catch the older wiser foxes. They don't, they're not silly enough to walk into a cage normally. Um, same for um, feral cats as well, a bit more success with trapping feral cats in cages. Um, so it's soft jaw foot traps, your other option. They're a bit more, uh, you need a few more techniques and a bit riskier in terms of you need to cover them by day for sure um, to avoid trapping something else. Um, and there's ways to install them that you can avoid trapping something that you don't want to get. Um, and it's trap and release if you catch something like a brush tail possum. So firstly, um, what's legal in your location? So people might be in different areas um, and New South Wales ACT, there's this wonderful website called Pest Smart that has all sorts of information on control of feral animals across Australia and what the options are and what's legal in your jurisdiction. So I'm just going to um, share the Pest Smart resource. Um, so I've got up here, this is um, the Zoom thingy is hiding my, um, my panel. There we go. So there's this website, it's called Pest Smart. So at pestsmart.org.au. Um, and then you can select your, your pest animal or type up the top. Um, it's got different animals. And then you get, uh, this one is open for European foxes. So on this, this side here, on the, on the right side, you've got management framework. So you've got, um, you can go down and find, um, you know, management options, manage. So the management code of practice, and then there's different trapping options that you can go to. So I've gone to the trapping using padded jaw foot traps. Um, so it's up here, padded jaw foot traps. And in this section, it also covers, it has a table down below that shows you what's legal in your jurisdiction, which is pretty key because Depending on the animal, say if you're after feral cats, I think in some jurisdictions you're not allowed to, for example, use soft jaw foot traps. So you really need to be making sure you're doing what's legal wherever you happen to be. So if you see here, if you're ACT or if you're New South Wales, 
Um, steel door traps are the, the ones that don't have um, rubber on the edges and they, they can sometimes be those horror jagged ones that just, like if anything else gets caught, it's just a horrible way to die or experience. So they're totally out. So trapping with padded door traps, I'll grab your padded door trap so you can see. Um, um, trapping using padded door traps is permitted in ACT. Um, and then there's legislation around it. So there's links to legislation there. So depending on where you are, you can look yourself up and see what's permitted in your jurisdiction. So that's um, Fox. There's also under each animal, there's the code of practice, a list of things, best practice management. So what, what management you can do. Um, so control strategies under, under each animal, you can look at what your control strategy options are. So fertility, exclusion, fencing, but if you want to actually take them out, you've got you know, lethal baiting, that's out for me for my property. 1080, that's out for me for my property. Strychnine, same. Shooting, um, not permitted. Fumigation of fox dens, the fox dens are not on my property to do that. So next down is trapping. That's, that's what I've got for my, my options to control um, foxes. So there's also um, for feral dogs, wild dogs as well come back soon. Um, there we go. <laughs> Zoom's getting in the way of my links. Um, feral cats, there's a feral cat one. Um, so there's one for each animal. So that's a great resource. I suggest you go and have a look just to double check because you want to make sure that whatever you're doing um, is legal for your jurisdiction. Um, sorry. Stop share. There we go. Apologies. Um, radio. So next, I'm going to go to um, demo how to use treadle traps. There's um, cage traps that have. There's different options of cage traps. Some have um, a, like a, a cage thingy in it, dangling thing that you put meat inside that the animal pulls and that closes the door of the trap. And other. Um, Cage traps have like a foot pad that they stand on and the door slams shut. So I'm going to show you um, demos of how to set both of those two up first for those of you that um, aren't interested in soft jaw traps um, initially. So just bear with me. I'll just start that video and share it. Share screen. Here we go. Cool. Okay. So this is on my property. Um, I've picked a spot where I think um, a fox or a cat might go. Um, set it up. Um, I, it is, this is good, a, a good idea to do some monitoring and figure out which path it travels and which direction it travels in. So you put the opening in the direction that it travels. Now, the first thing to do with um, handling is to use gloves because a lot of animals, feral predators are shy. Uh, you don't want to put human scent on them. So do use gloves. If you have a look at this, if an animal gets inside and rummages around, it can actually roll the trap over and open that trap door. So if you're setting a trap, you really need to either peg it to the ground or tie it to something so it doesn't roly-poly and open up and your trapped animal releases and you will never trap it again because it will remember that experience. Uh, so generally, a a peg in each corner, if you've got them, is a good thing to do. It's going to fast forward the pegging bit, probably get the idea. It's a bit awkward here because I've got the tree trunk on the other side, so I can only do three. So the next thing is bait. Um, this time I'm using sardines. Um, if you're after, say, feral cats, foxes, both of them like sardines, so do brush tail possums. So expect you might have a brush tail possum as well, but that's okay. Um, you might even trap them a couple of nights in the row, so clearly not that traumatized. So I put sardines right at the back. If you see, this trap has a treadle, that's where the foot pad that the animal stands on that and the door slams shut. So put the bait right at the back, um, but then also it's a good idea to sprinkle some of the juices and um, oils around the front of the trap at the entrance as well. Uh, and it's also recommended for a week or two before actually um, setting the trap 
well, before putting a trap in place to free feed so they get used to coming to that spot. And then also um, tie the door open and free feed um, around the trap so they get used to it being there. So that when it suddenly, um, they're used to coming for food and they're used to being comfortable in that space and they're more likely to enter the trap than if you just randomly suddenly put a trap there and put bait inside um, and expect them to be comfortable about climbing into a cage. So in terms of setting the trap, um, is that that slider thing is a thing that locks the door shut and it's this latch, you see that treadle? That's the thing that opens and, and um, pulls the door shut. So that trap's now set and I've also put a bit of chicken wing behind there too because I like to kind of make sure I've got a good chance of getting animal. Now, if you're urban, this might be one of your, um, probably your only option for trapping. So um, yeah, have a, have a try at different baits, um, free feed and be patient. You might not get them on the first night. You might not get them on the 10th night. You might get them on the third night or you might get them on the second, on the you know, second week. Uh, so patience and um, cunning, you've got to outsmart them. Now I'm going to share uh, just a short clip of a slightly different um, trap. That's the cage um, meat holding trap. Um, that's similar idea, cage trap, but um, just how you put the bait in is different and some people find it quite confusing. So we're just going to skip. Is it going to? Yeah. So when you set it up, make sure um, it's often good to put it in a spot that's kind of got cover around so it's nestled in something and there's a clear encouragement to go through that way into the cage rather than just have the cage just as a cage out in the open where a feral predator can walk all around it and do the what on earth is this thing I'm not going near that with the gloves do wear gloves when you're handling cage traps and bait and anything to do with the traps so this is a trap for different the cage trap with a different type of trigger mechanism um, put the bait in that little cage there uh, a chicken wing or something that's the right size that can slide down and get stuck. So you want the animals actually going to need to tug it and the bait won't come loose because um, that's actually the trigger mechanism. It, it needs to be able to try and get the bait and fail and trap itself in the process. So there's a little door there. You can see with a latch, that's how you get the bait right at the end. Um, you don't kind of reach in from the front entrance and smell the trap up with your body. So you see there's a door with a latch. You put your hand in and, and fit the bait in there. And um, I, people generally recommend the, um, that's, that's the, the latch mechanism. So that gets tugged, see how that's tugged and that's where the door opens there. Um, I've had reports um, People generally prefer the treadle type trap that's generally um, seems to be a bit more effective as a um, trigger mechanism than this cage um, type trap. But if you're borrowing from your local land services, often they have cage traps available. You get what you get and it's good to know how to set each type. Uh, and it doesn't hurt either with this type of trap to do the same drizzle of sardine oil uh, leading up to the front entrance from possibly a, a path that the, the fox or cat might come from. You say, hey, come here. Um, and even a bit of sardines at the back as well. But you'll need to kind of replenish that every so often because the smell of that dissipates. Uh, also note that feral predators or foxes like their meat um, often putrid and stinky. So when it's making your stomach churn is when they're um, salivating. So you might find with foxes that uh, they won't come when the meat is still fresh in the fridge. They'll come once it's starting to really stink. Alrighty, so that's kind of a quick how-to to set cage traps up. It's a nice little nestled in some native tomato plants up the back of my place. Uh, so next I'll show you how to set up foot traps. So this video is a bit longer, 
uh, beware foot traps. Well, can they're a bit more, um, uh, bit more effort, bit more strategy, bit harder to set up, and a few more risks involved. So, I'll show you a soft jaw foot trap um, quickly. It's it's hard to do open up with my my bare hands. I've got a trap set up, but um, the the padding is in the middle there. It's got rubber pads so it, it doesn't hurt the animal, um, and spring mechanisms, and it opens wide. Um, and then they have um, a spring, and then I attach them to a length of chain with an ending to be able to attach it to the anchor point. And I only ever handle them with gloves. It's very different doing a workshop with no face-to-face -face contact. <laughs> I haven't done a webinar like this for a little while. Just so Alice, I've just unmuted myself just to say that it, it's looking good so far. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Yes, it's just weird because there's just deathly silence and I've got no face interaction at all. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, I, I think people are interested. I'll just pretend they are. <laughs> yeah. Um, and just to invite anyone, if they can, if they wanted to um, put a, any questions into the chat function there, that they can. Yeah. Um, and if, if there's any dramas with the chat, whoop, they can raise their hand. Yeah, absolutely. So happy to take questions along the way or um, listen and learn and um, questions at the end up to you. All right, so I'll share the next video. That's um, share, there we go. That's a simple setting up, just a simple single foot trap at a spot um, out the back, um, just to show you kind of what's involved in setting up a foot trap. So I have an anchor that I attach to something that um, would stand if it was a large Alsatian attached to it. You, it's awkward. You do not want whatever it is trapped to um, end up, perhaps if it's your neighbor's dog, to turn up at their place with a trap still attached to its foot. That's a bad look. So um, number one thing is to make sure that your trap that you set is firmly attached to an anchor that will not give um, if something is caught and um, is bouncing up and down and trying to get off. So that's actually um, quite a strong little um, waddle at the back of my place. I use them quite often for um, box traps. Also fence posts, star pickets, large trees. Um, so the first thing is um, figuring out a spot where a, a fox or a cat would logically put their foot to say step over or that you could has a back to it so that you put the bait um, say where, where that stick is going up, I'd put the bait there. So the nose is wanting to go and have a look at the bait and the foot is logically going to come just before that. And that's where you put the trap so that the foot goes onto the trap. Um, it, it needs, you kind of need to have a think about the dimension of the animal that you're trapping. Um, it's, it's kind of gait and where its nose would be and where its front foot would be and strategize where you place things. So make a hole because you're actually burying it. You make a hole in the soil. Um, I use a sieve like that because whatever goes on top of the trap, it needs to be not chunky. It just needs to be uh, just plain um, earth of small kind of um, dimensions. Because if it's chunky, it'll interfere with the, the trap closing and the animal will get away. So the next thing I do, foot traps. I'm a little person and my hand strength isn't gigantuous. Um, so I actually find opening these foot traps quite um, challenging. I have to use you know, legs and arms to do it, which isn't great for smelling them up. So I've got a trap setter that um, makes this process really easy. It opens it up, trap up, and then I can put that dangly trigger mechanism against the pad and set it like that. And so up to you if you're a a big strong kind of normal size male then you might find setting them no problem but if you're a, say an older person or a smaller person a trap center might be the way to go so now so put the trap into your hole that you've made but and then do attach it to your anchor point before you forget it must be anchored um, 
Uh, and you, it's a good idea to bury anchor under leaf litter and stuff because anything exposed, foxes are very shy, sly creatures. So anything that's human smelling, weird looking, it will uh, scare them away. So you basically want to have your setup be visibly invisible and as smelling as little as human as possible. Uh, also, you note that I'm not kneeling on the ground. I'm not sitting on the ground. I've just got my boots on the ground and I'm using well-worn gardening gloves. Um, if you need to water a tree or you need to um, expel some air from your body, I suggest you do that well away from your trap set because you don't want to um, scent up the area and make a fox decide that that is not going to be part of its nightly route anymore. Um, the other aspect is that see how it's set. That's kind of the direction, um, the front to the back, that the trap needs to be set um, for the foot to correctly be trapped. Now, the next thing is it needs to have um, cover over the foot pad to prevent it from being buried in soil because there needs to be actually air underneath the foot pad for the foot pad to depress when it's stood on. Um, there's a few different options, but I use those really thin sandwich bags. I split them in two and completely un untie them. So it's kind of the top to the bottom, two pieces. I use that to cover the foot pad to make sure that it doesn't get um, cover, well, um, inundated with soil so it can't depress when the animal stands on it. If it gets buried in soil and there's soil underneath the pad, it just won't go off. It'll just sit there as a fossil. So you see how all the corners are tucked in, um, not over the pad. You don't want crumply plastic over the pad. Just, um, sorry, over the, over the jaw mechanism. You just want it um, covering that inner area. Now up to you, um, you can do this by hand. It does take a lot longer, but you just want small gauge stuff going over the trap. No chunkies, no sticks, no rocks, just small stuff. If you live in WA and you've just got sand, that's so much easier. Um, I'm on shale country, so I end up with large numbers of rocks in my sieve. You can make a sieve or you can buy a sieve. Um, so that's what it looks like. It's got a pile of soil over the top. That's, that's um, initial. It's going to depress and you need to flatten that over the trap and basically make it level with the ground. And you want probably the soil is you know, nicely fluffed up. Once it depresses, you'll have probably about uh, less than half a centimetre um, over the depth of soil over the foot pad. Well, less than half a centimetre, like a few millimetres, but so it's not exposed. You don't want it exposed. It needs to be at, nothing to see here. Well hidden as much as you can when you dig a hole in the ground in a forest. So this is setting the trap in. So regardless of how it gets, um, it doesn't move. Something's popped up. Can everyone still see the video? Got this weird thing. Yes, we can still see it. It's just gone a little bit smaller, um, but I can still see it. That's weird. Okay, um, and that's pretty much done, but I'm going off now to get some forest litter. Uh, yep, here we go. So that's, this is just showing what it looks like. So um, setting the trap in like that. So around the edges, if you, you, if you touch the foot pad and put pressure on, it will go off. But if you touch the jaws, the edges, it won't go off. So you need to set the trap in, push the soil in around the jaw to make it um, not tilt, teeter, rock, um, and an even layer of soil over the top. What on earth is happening here, Mailbox? I can see it okay. You can see it okay? I've just got this weird thing pop up. Um, and this is a forest litter. That fine gauge again, so you don't want sticks, you don't want big leaves, it needs to be really fine. But that's kind of covering it up to make it not look really obviously a hole dug in the ground. Um, if you're in an area with bare patches, with actual like deep soil, um, then you can make a, a bare patch look quite naturally bare. But this is in a forest with a bedrock of shale underneath. So I'm doing the best I can to make it look invisible. And this time I decided to use some sardines on the direction where I'm expecting the fox will travel to. So I'm expecting where my feet are, that's where it will come from. And that's where it will go to.
So there we go. That's a single foot trap set all done. And that took a bit of time. So that's that's lifetime. So that's kind of about how long it took me to do a single one of those. Stop share. Okay. All righty. So did anyone, here we go. I've got a question. Everyone type a message. Oh, good. You saw the question. Would you cover the cage with plastic or hessian? Yeah. Um, hessian or plastic is a suggested thing, but you want to make sure that the plastic or hessian doesn't have lots of human smell on it. Uh, so if it's um, come from, say, Bunnings and it's got loads of well, chemical smells and your smells and everyone else's smells that have been handling it, um, probably not great. Or if you grab some hessian from perhaps Bunnings and you've got chickens or, or sheep or something and you stick it in a spot in their pen or paddock and get it all smelling like them um, over the human smell, that's probably a better idea because otherwise you're coating your trap with a deterrent. Um, so absolutely, um, they're two good options for the trap by day, right. Uh, so the next really important aspect if you're setting foot traps is that um, you can accidentally catch animals by day that um, it's not great to. So uh, it's really important to um, this one, to, to cover them. If you're going to leave them um, for a few days, I leave them for a few days. So I, I, I cover them every day. This one, share. Here we go, it's behaving again. Uh, so this is just a short video to really hone it in that um, this is one of my old sets that I've caught many, many foxes over the years on. And there's me in the morning covering it up. So I go for my morning run and there's me in the evening um, when I come back. Well, that's on a weekend. I'm wearing my weekend gear and I'm home at 5.20. So clearly not a day. Um, there's me in the morning um, taking the cover off. There's me in the evening, well, sorry, morning putting the cover on, me in the evening taking the cover off. Um, so I find trapping in winter a bit tricky because I'm often home way after dark and it's a bit late. So I tend to trap um, in the longer days when I'm not disturbing the nightlife dark. So I, it needs to be the gauge that um, feet, the, the traps wouldn't be able to close over the thing. Um, this is something I do. I'm in clay area, clay country. So when it rains, the clay all gets gunged up and I have to re reset all the traps because it forms a like a concrete layer over the top. So I actually cover them all up with plastic so I can fur that rainy patch of time that we had. Um, so covering your traps is really, really important. Also, if you're doing foot traps and any kind of cage trap, they look rosella walk straight over the top of the traps. It shouldn't set them off because it's a bit lighter, but you know, that's just not something you want to have on yourself. Um, lizards as well. So covering traps is, and, and being trap responsible. So I'll just cover that next. If, regardless if you're using cage traps or foot traps, it's pretty distressing if you're caught in a foot or a cage trap. So you really need to be, if you're going to trap, you need to be home um, in terms of not overnight going away holidays. You need to check it every morning. Um, cage traps, if you leave them open by day, trap them every morning, trap them every afternoon, so that if you caught a daytime animal, um, then it's got the ability to go home um, in daylight hours. Or if you've caught a nocturnal animal first thing in the morning, let it out, um, likely a possum, they'll scoot up the nearest tree and be okay. But you must not leave them for, you know, a day or two or three or a week without being checked. Um, foot traps, even more so. So um, first thing in the morning, go check them um, and release if you've got accidentally caught a possum um, or deal with if you've caught a fox, uh, et cetera. And if you're leaving them out by day, please, please cover them by day. Um, if you've got pets like dogs or cats and you want to use foot traps, then you'll need to keep them in overnight because um, they're often like the same bait as foxes do. And you can cover them by day with whatever you can use that your pet won't dig or ferret around in. Right. So next I've caught my um, feral predator. Trapped that one. Share. 
Right, so I've caught my feral predator. Um, there's Loxy. Now what do I do? Um, imagine if it was in the cage trap too. So the recommended method for dispatching is shooting. Um, so if you don't have a gun, that's all good. Um, friendly neighbor with a gun. There are other methods that people talk about around the traps. I can't recommend those, but just saying. Um, I have... Stop sharing now. Um, I don't have a gun license. I used to have, um, well, I used to have a list of friendly neighbors with um, that had guns that I just call around and share the love and say, hey, you know, dude, I've got a fox. Were you able to come and dispatch it this morning? And I'd find someone that would. Um, if you're rural and you don't shoot, um, there will be loads of people around that have firearms that will be more than willing to assist control foxes. Uh, I now have a captive bolt gun. It doesn't need a license. Um, it's German efficiency, scarily. Um, you, you know, point blank range, uh, there's a diagram for each animal where to put it and it's one shot and it's done. Um, so that's what I use and that's what, I, I don't wanna have to deal with a gun. I don't wanna have a locked cabinet. I don't wanna go shooting a few times a year, um, practice shooting to keep my license. I'm just, just not really into guns. Um, so this is a good option. Um, they're a bit XC, but if you control feral predators a bit um, and you, you'd like me and you don't have a gun or don't want one, it's an option. Um, they come different size thingy me jiggies um, that go inside. So the green ones are for little animals like foxes and cats. Um, very efficient, extremely easy to use. So is option. Um, another question you might want to ask is, uh, what do I do restraining wise? You can either shoot them off because the captive bolt pistol requires me to get point blank range. Um, I use a, a snare um, that's, well, it's, it's targeted for, you know, controlling trapped um, or dogs and cats and things that because it's long, you hold it out and the animal and it goes around the animal's neck and the animal can't get you but you can control it so that you can um, do what you want to do. Um, and it's, it's very efficient. It'll be over, done and dusted in. You know, you set yourself up, will away, organize the things, um, get practice and then go and do the deed. And it literally is, you know, um, 30 seconds a minute type thing. Radio, so bait, what kind of baits to use depending on what you're trying to trap? I Excuse use a very- me, sorry, sorry to interrupt there. Yeah. Um, I guess um, we should let people know too that Southeast Local Land Services can sometimes come and help, can they? Do, do you know much about that? Yeah, um, I've heard reports. That, um, local land services are sometimes available to come and dispatch on weekdays only, nine to five only, I yeah. think. So it doesn't suit a lot of people. And I've had a few neighbours trap things on weekends. Um, yeah. So it's, it is an option, but just be aware of limitations of that. Um, but I, what I did when I first landed here, I think I did a call around for my first box of um, or post on the local Facebook group of, uh, of Trapped a Fox. Would anyone be able to um, help me dispatch it? And I got a bunch of PMs, private messages, because uh, people don't like to generally share their details online or say they're a shooter. Um, I had about like 10 or 15 different local guys um, offer their assistance so I just kept them and um, asked if they wouldn't mind if I if I call them at some point and then I just went through the list to share the love when I trapped boxes um, yeah yeah can you see that message there from Lee about is a car exhaust an option for disposal um, I don't think that's on the list of um, approved and recommended options um, at, on, so, the, on the feral scan but it may be for some jurisdictions. So do you think if I popped the feral scan web page in, in the chat function, would that be too um, disruptive? If yeah, no, go for it. Yeah. I, I just don't want to draw people away from, from listening to you. That's all. Maybe I'll do that oh, at the end. Oh, it's the, yeah, the Pest Smart. Sorry, it's the Pest Smart one. Yeah, so, I'll, pop that, I'll pop that in at the end. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Pest Smart has... Um, has on it what you're allowed to do with um, 
once you once you trap animals and what what you legally permitted to yeah. do um and what so take that as a list of what you're legally permitted to do and what you choose to do is something that you know um you keep to yourself but it's not something that um you could have legally recommended by anyone yeah yeah got it sorry sorry to jump in there Alice oh, no, that's, disrupt that's your awful. flow yeah not a problem radio so dispatch so bait bait is a is a pretty important thing so you've got to choose something that makes them salivate uh, I've discovered well local foxes um, one of the main diets of foxes in in Australia is rabbits so it's kind of well known that if you take out the rabbit population without first controlling the fox population then all of a sudden you suddenly have um, foxes predating all sorts of native animals that they weren't in, in much larger numbers than they what they were before so um, you, if you want to control rabbits you kind of need to control your foxes first so you don't hit the native animal population but that being said if you're driving down the road, like uh, you might see me occasionally, and there's a dead rabbit in the middle of the road, I'll come to a screeching stop, grab the rabbit, put it in a bucket or a chook food bag and um, use that for my next uh, fox trapping. Um, that's I've found foxes really, really like rabbits, but they like them best when they're um, really whiffy. Uh, another thing, if you raise chickens and you have excess roosters, cockerels, dispatch them. You're not, you're not allowed to use live bait. Um, in cage traps or foot, you know, around foot traps. So dispatch them. I dispatch them whole, feathers and all, um, and use them as as bait with a ring of traps around. Um, not a single trap that. So sardines, chicken, whole chicken. You can use if you're a city person. You can use chicken wings, sardines. Um, if you're a farmer and you're taking out kangaroos, you can use a bit of kangaroo or a small kangaroo ring of traps around. They're good options. Um, dispatch by shooting. So soft jaw foot traps. So if you're going for soft jaw foot traps, there's a few things that you need to consider because when you get the soft jaw foot trap on its own, you can't actually do anything with it. It's like I'll buy a single trap. Um, probably won't get you that far. So you get a trap this bit, um, but then you, it's actually good to add a length of chain. Um, use good quality components because you don't want an animal turning up with a trap attached to its foot um, somewhere. That's going to make that person hate all trappers around. Um, so all, all sturdy components with all the joins. So I add about half a metre of chain. Um, then I can use that as its own anchor or tie it around depending on the shape and size of the bait. It gives me options um, and it gives them a bit of more, get a bit of movement freedom for movement when they're attached as well and they get a bit less stressed if they can move around and um, then if they're really tightly tied to a spot um, so I use to tie everything together I use two millimeter tie wire double thickness um, and really strong twists I've made a lot of trick pens and also, good quality weight like weight rated um u and d locks so things that if they get in the soil and air they're not going to rust closed or open and they're not chi cheap chinese things that will just bend and open um, because then the animal will take off with our trap attached to your foot and either die a slow and painful agonizing death or um turn up at your neighbor's house if it's their pet cat or, or dog um and that would be really awkward um, yep, so trail and this is a vessel type thing that you can make it home yourself. Um, for anchors, um, anchor points need to be something really strong that just imagine an Alsatian could be tied to and wouldn't be able to give because foxes, when they first get trapped, or well, you don't know what's going to get caught up to a certain size. So um, large animals like macropods, kangaroos, wallabies, um, humans, they step on the trap and the trap closes and they just walk off. It's a bit of a toe tickle, but it's not, they don't get trapped. It's only smaller things. Next on my card. Okay, Shane, daytime cover, okay. Yep, so they're the kind of the mix of things. Radio, so now you've got your, um, you've decided you wanna control feral predators on your property. 
um, rural property, um, urban property, you're not comfortable using foot traps, you're interested in using foot traps, um, totally up to you, but they're kind of some how-to options. Now for a plan. So um, what's your end goal? So you have perhaps chickens and you're worried that there's a fox visiting them each night and you just want to take out that fox or that family of foxes in a one-off thing. Um, or you like me and you have a rural property that you're managing for, well, also for wildlife habitat. So I'm actually wanting to actively kind of either eradicate or near eradicate foxes in a permanent way um, into the future. So that needs um, maintenance um, or you want to just reduce the numbers to a certain level. That's also a maintenance thing. So um, yeah, that will then tell you the frequency of trapping. So if you just have a, a problem fox that you want to take out, then borrow a trap from a local land service perhaps and take out that fox and hand the trap back. Um, if you're like me and you want to kind of control long term, then it's good to invest in, I'll show you right at the end, um, my um, sledgehammer approach to fox trapping where I put a ring of traps around bait and I have four sets four sets of traps that I can put four or five traps around bait in across the different parts of my property. Um, that if I'm doing a blitz, I tend to put three or, yeah, three or four trap sets out in the different parts of my property because there's actually different foxes that travel there. Um, and then I go do around and check them every morning, cover them every morning and check and uncover them each night. Um, and then I do that for say a, two months or so and get them all. So frequently, if you haven't trapped or controlled animals, feral predators before in your property, then you might, you'll probably need to do an initial blitz if you want to get them all um, and just keep going and monitor, keep going until you get every last one. And that can take a while because there might be a few and you've got an old wise mating pair um, that have been shot at and had people go at them in, around before. So they're a bit, bit shy of things. So they can take a bit of effort to get, but they can eventually be got. Uh, and then um, seasonal annual annual maintenance is kind of what I do. So every year or last year, I just life didn't happen. So I didn't do it last year. Um, in theory, I do annual maintenance. Time of year, it actually kind of depends on the region. I've read recommendations for different seasons, um, but that doesn't match with my experience for our um, very cold winters and very hot summers. So for my region, Canberra region, I've found that um, the worst time to trap is now late autumn to end of winter, that I find that the, the vixens tend to not stray far from home because they're raising bubs and they tend to be quite shy and, and cautious. And the males are kind of um, actually more focused on finding a mate um, now-ish and less interested in exploring tasty food options. Um, so I find that just the behaviour side of things and interactions, they're just less likely to do something dumb or stray out of their usual path and they're much more mission focused. I find early spring um, to end of summer, early spring is when you start to get the bubs out and about, you can get them all quite easily um, through to end of summer. Um, early spring is also mid spring. Mid spring is when you tend to get the kits from last year or the year before going walkabout, um, which is a good time to get your do your maintenance because they'll be new to your area. They won't know what is normal and what isn't normal on your property. And they're much more likely to walk into a trap because they won't be doing that. That wasn't there last year. That wasn't there last week. That wasn't there last month. What on earth is that? Um, so it's, it's yeah, when you're dealing with shy, cautious creatures, it's something to consider. And monitoring. Um, Alice. Yeah. Um, there's a question there, mate. Uh, can you see that? Do the animals. Um, for a fox, the, um, there isn't much damage actually done to um, the animal. And if you get your pet dog in the trap, you'll know because all hell, it'll, it'll um, yell and, um, and holler. Uh, my, I used to catch my neighbor's dog because that used to use my property as a latrine every weekend um, when they collect firewood up the back. So I caught it probably every weekend for four months. Um, they come running and release it after we uh, established that I was within my rights to control foxes on my property and their dog wasn't really supposed to be on my property stat. Uh, no damage was ever done and it did the same thing, got itself caught every weekend for the same chicken wings. Um, clearly not so traumatised. Um, electrician didn't tell me they were bringing a dog and 
um, the little foxy got caught also in a trap, um, released immediately. So pet dog, um, not, a, not really great if it's there for hours. Uh, if you have a pet dog, uh, tra cover your traps by day, keep your dog in at night. Um, generally not, not good. Foxes are, um, they tend to just sit and wait. Once they're trapped, they do a bit of a flip around and then they, they wait. Um, dogs can be a bit more um, energetic in trying to get off. So it's not great to have a pet dog, you know, caught in a trap for a few hours, more than, more than a few hours, for like half a day or a day. Um, that's not great. So that all comes down to um, responsible trapping. Um, but it is separately a good way to encourage your neighbour not to let their dog run. Right. Monitoring. Monitoring is a big part as well. If you're kind of like me, um, that well, and wanting to control foxes across the trap uh, across your property, that uh, you can set a trap up, and if it's not on a path that a fox would travel, then it just won't get any attention at all. I've I've had way more success, or I've had really good success when I found the path that foxes go on. Uh, don't install traps along the kangaroo path or a path that's used by lots of other animals because they'll just get set off all the time. Won't catch anything, not kangaroos, but you'll have to keep resetting them. So set them off, predators often have their own path or set them off a main path that a kangaroo isn't gonna um, jump across and set all your traps off, you have to reset them. Um, I've had a lot more success with um, setting traps up next to where foxes travel versus randomly putting a trap over there and assuming, well, there must be foxes that go into that area. Um, putting a camera up, set a trap up and the camera recorded no fox action and the trap got absolutely no attention. And that was a waste of a perfectly good um, cockerel that I could have used elsewhere. Uh, that's pretty much all I was going to cover. I'm just going to go for a quick, um, oh yeah, the other thing. Um, if you do use um, bait, um, larger bait than sardines sphere trapping, um, then you do need to, um, sorry, share screen, talking at the same time, that one. You do need to um, peg them down because if you don't peg them down, you also want the fox to be able to pull, argue, scrummage and step on a trap rather than just walk over the trap, grab the chicken wing in this case. This was me back in 2017 as a novice. Um, I didn't tie, I thought, oh, she'll be right. I've circled the chicken wing with traps and um, the fox grabbed the chicken wing and off it went. Uh, so you get better success if you very sturdily stake your, um, your bait um, with, with tent pegs. I'm just going to close with a final video. This is my sledgehammer. Um, approach to trapping that I, I tend to use more. Um, doing this, you disturb the ground and you scent up the ground a bit more. And so it takes probably a week or so for your scent to dissipate, for them to start to be interested in inspecting the, op, the, the bait that you've left. Um, sorry, I have to share it. That one. Uh, and also uh, if you're using bait that doesn't make you wretch when you're installing the trap, then it'll take a little while for it to smell um, delectable from a fox's perspective, as in stinky and whiffy. That's when they'll be most interested. So I'll, this is a fast forward type um, recording of me setting up um, an array of traps around a roadkill rabbit that I picked up off the road that morning or afternoon. So I'm pegging the legs and the neck of the rabbit to the ground two pegs each different directions to make it a tug of war that the fox is not gonna win. Um, the rabbit is not going to move and it's gonna stay there. So now this is the, the trap setting bit. I might fast forward that. That's kind of how the, trap set up. This is a long one. I think I made this trap for um, installing around a, a large deceased kangaroo right back when I was first trying to get a very wise old fox. So this is the trap setting side of things again. Might fast forward that. Seen that. There we go, now we're in 
class forward again. So what I do is I set all the charts first, open them all up, get them all prepped and ready to go, in my working space. Um, then I grab my sieve and I, I do a whole vibe, well, like I kind of plan out where I'm going to do my holes. I do it all with gloves. Because you need to kind of set the traps a certain distance apart, enough so they're not going to interfere with each other. There's the plastic bag trick. And just another look at the plastic bag when you're setting traps. Really thin plastic doesn't crinkle and disturb them so much. And make sure it's tucked in well away from that soft jaw padded edge. You can see the soft jaw there. So that's, I um, don't flatten and smooth the soil around the traps each one by one until I've done them all because you can forget where they are and accidentally step on them, <laughs> done that. Um, so it's better to make it really obvious to you until right at the end where the traps are and then you don't step on them. And just note, I'm attaching each trap as I go to the anchor point so I do not forget a single trap. And I've only put four traps there. That's me covering um, the anchor point and that's me flattening, smoothing the soil out around and setting the traps in. So that's kind of what you look like at the end. So it's disturbed ground, um, can't really avoid that in the forested area. So it does take a little while for foxes to decide to risk venturing in. And there's the leaf litter that I grabbed from nearby. Um, that doesn't go raw over the top. That would stop a trap from going. So I just sieve that, sprinkle that over the top. So it at least smells and looks a bit more foresty. Um, so that's my um, sledgehammer approach to trapping using soft jaw foot traps. Uh, that will generally take maybe a week or week and a half for a fox to be interested once the rubber gets a bit whiffy or once the smell of me is dissipated. I don't actually find that another family move in when I catch a family. Um, so when I originally caught all the foxes, eight foxes on my property that were visiting every night, I actually had wildlife cameras up for a good, well, I have wildlife cameras permanently up looking. Um, the question is when you caught a family, do you find another lot move in? Um, I caught the vixen, I caught the, the breeding adults, I caught their bubs and I caught the the um, teenagers looking to move into new territory that were following the adults. So I caught a lot um, and removed them. So I think I had absolutely no foxes visiting except an occasional passerby for eight months. And then I started to get a few, like one or two ish, regular ish. And then I got them. And then I had another six to eight months with pretty much nothing. Um, so I find then you do this, so it's kind of maintenance after that to keep the numbers down. It actually really depends on your neighbours too and what they're doing. And um, if you've got, or oh, say, a national park nearby, it is a bit trickier. But um, if you take out the breeding pair and then you just do general maintenance over time, you really significantly reduce the fox population. Um, my neighbours on the other side reported hearing foxes calling, you know, most nights commonly for 15 years straight. And then they haven't heard foxes calling um, for the last five years. And that's kind of when I moved in and took out all the foxes. So Alice, um, that's been wonderful. Um, I, I think, um, would you, you have sort of touched on a little bit just then with your comments about people haven't heard the foxes since you started doing the management, which I mean, is having a good, good effect in the landscape. Um, but I know just from watching your Facebook page that there's some really, like, really wonderful benefits for, for the local wildlife. So just, just briefly want to say what, what results you've, you've observed? Yeah, sure. Um, so I have, well, I have a lot of nest boxes on my property. Most of them are flying birds, so they, they roost in trees. But I have um, native ducks, wood ducks, uh, grey teals and Pacific black ducks that also nest on my property in nest boxes and tree hollows. They, the ducklings, jump out of the trees, of the tree hollows when they're kind of 24 to 48 hours old and they're, you know, ducklings, um, fluffy. They cannot fly. They can't fly for several, well, for many weeks until they grow feathers and they get big enough to be able to have wings to fly away. 
So by night, they have to sleep on the ground um, and their parents as well. Um, and so ducks sleeping on the ground at night, um, free roaming cats and foxes. Fo if, if, you, if I find a dead duck on the road and I use that as fox bait, I will catch foxes with that. They love duck. Um, they love duck even more than they love rabbit. Um, I just don't recommend it as a bait because that might encourage people to go out and shoot a native duck to use it as bait. Um, so, yeah. Um, and with the parents and the bubs sleeping on the ground by night, the adults are also at risk. So you might not, that might not just be the ducklings that get taken. It probably would be the parents also protecting them. Uh, so controlling feral predators is um, a really good thing for those types of birds. Also small to medium um, size mammals, say bandicoots, uh, all the things, or basically all the things that you look at that used to exist here, the small to medium sized mammals that no longer exist, there's a reason for that. And it's kind of the fox and cat story. Uh, so um, ground dwelling birds, quail, um, lizards, um, all sorts of things, that native animals. If there's a, there were originally on my property, um, eight foxes and six cats, that's 15 feral predators patrolling eight acres, patrolling four acres of bush every single night of the year. That's a huge predator burden. Mm. Yeah, that's wonderful, Alice. Um, so I just put a few um, resources into the chat function there. Um, and I'm just going to, is there anything else like, is it okay if I jump in now and just talk about the camera loan program? Yeah, go for it. Yep, that's it. So I'll share my screen and just do that now. Um, so I'd just like to tell you about the camera loan program from the Small Farms Network. Uh, financial members can borrow a wildlife camera to do their wild um, to do feral predator monitoring and also monitoring for wildlife. Um, and there are the details on the screen there. Um, so you can um, become a member on our website and you can also um, organise your camera loan on, on our website, which is smallfarmscapital.org. Membership costs $22 per financial year. Um, and this is one of the programs that is a benefit of, um, of being a member. Um, so that project was supported by the Veolia um, Trust, um, Mulwari Veolia Trust, and we, um, we thank them for their support and also local land services. So I just wanted to tell you about some of our upcoming events uh, in the next month. Um, the Small Farms Business Group meeting will be via Zoom. That is for a members, uh, a members only meeting. Um, and that is following on from our enterprises from small farms network from small farms um, workshop um, back in May. Uh, um, so uh, that's just going to be a discussion about starting a business, what people are doing, um, and how those people might um, how those members might be able to support each each other on their journey. We've got uh, predator proofing animal enclosures coming up um, on the twentieth of June. That's a half day workshop in Baiwong, um, and there'll be two sessions, a morning and an afternoon session. Um, and that is $15 per person. Per person. Um, and once again, you can register on our website for that. Um, and Sheep Health for Small Flocks webinar, that's on the 30th of June um, and from 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, and also you can book on our website for that one. Just from following on from what Alice has talk, talked about today, um, I'd just like to invite you to, if you wanted to, you can take a screenshot of that. Um, but I, I have actually posted some of them into the chat function. But if it helps, you can actually take a screenshot there. Um, Southeast Local Land Services have biosecurity offices in each of their um, offices where people, um, where the biosecurity officers can help you with feral animal um, uh, monitor, uh, trapping and monitoring. Um, they coordinate um, management plans. Um, they can help inspect properties for declared pests and help you develop a control plan. 
They provide advice on controlling pest animals, group baiting projects, programs for, um, for groups and individuals. There's, they also offer free accredited online training for baiting programs and also sell baits to rate players and it can advise you on any baiting program if you wanted to do that. We've already, we've already talked about PestSmart. Um, Feral Scan is, a, is a, another place where you can actually put in what you are, the details of what you're trapping, which can be helpful in terms of planning on a community level. So I just wanted to tell you about our Facebook group, which is a Small Farms Network Capital Region um, discussion group on Facebook. Now, this is open to anyone um, with a small farm. Um, so basically, that's a place where you can share your experiences um, um, on your farm. Um, you can post a question, you can ask for information. Um, I put all sorts of information on there from, from what's happening in the, um, in, in the group. So you're more than welcome to join us there if you, if you wanted to. Um, I just wanted to let you know that we have um, all of our previous webinars are recorded and they're on the Small Farms Network YouTube channel. Um, and you can subscribe there too if you wanted to make sure that you um, keep up to date with what we're doing. And just a reminder, if you're coming to the demonstration, if you could please read your email and sign in using the online registration form, that would be wonderful. And please bring gloves. As yes, well, so thank you, Alice. Yeah, please bring um, along your gloves if you wanted to um, handle the, the traps. And just a little note about feedback. You can do that in lots of different ways. You can type your, any comments you wanted into the chat function now if you want to. You can send us an email to that email address or a survey link will pop up after this Zoom session. Um, and it'd be great if you could take the time just to give us some feedback about the webinar and also um, about what you would like to learn about. That's, I guess, your opportunity to tell us how, it, how things went for you. And just finally, just a reminder about our website and our Facebook page. Um, there's, there they are. Um, I hope you will join us. Um, you can sign up for our free newsletter. and. Um, we we love to hear from you on um, on the members Facebook page. So I'm Alice. I'm just going to stop my share there and start my video. Hopefully, oh, there we go. I came back for a minute. There we, there we go. go. Okay. All right. How do you think we went, Alice? Did we get? Did we cover everything that you wanted to? Yeah, I hope so. Um, yeah. Couldn't see faces, so I couldn't see what people were thinking. But hopefully, everyone got the info they needed. And otherwise. Um, Questions are welcome to. Yep, yep, sure, sure thing. So you can always, that's a, that's a good good point, Alice. People are welcome to a, a email any questions for you um, and I'm happy to um, reply. We will also have a workshop summary up on our um, website in a couple of, in, in, a, in about a week where you can go and find out um, more information. Okay, well, thanks, Alice. Thanks, everyone, for joining us this morning. Um, and I'm going to end the session there. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all out at, um, in Womboing uh, later today. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.